I was told that actually YCIS has awesome poetry teachers and that I would have offend people if we went with that intro. So not you guys, but back when I learned and in every other school than this one specifically. And not the Harbor School either. Sorry, Christine. But if you left high school thinking that poetry is boring and archaic and something that happens far away in the past, then I really don't blame you. I want to figure out kind of why that is, and I want to tell you why poetry doesn't have to suck. Uh, imagine, if you will, if you went into a history class, and they taught you all this interesting history, all these wars, and then you get to 1916, and they stop 100 years from right now, and they never tell you anything else. You'd probably be sitting here wondering how World War I ended, uh, if it ended at all. Spoiler alert, it did end. I think the Lannisters won? I'm, I'm a little behind, something like that. <laughs> I'm not sure, someone will tell me after. I assume there are history teachers here. Or imagine if you went into a chemistry class and everything you learned was about phlogiston, which is the theory that some stuff inside stuff has fire in it and that's why some things combust and other things don't. You never learned about atoms and you never learned about molecular bonding. You would be a pretty crappy chemist when you left high school. And you probably would think that chemistry wasn't really that interesting, wasn't relatable, and wasn't modern. We kind of do that with poetry. If you've studied poetry in high school, you probably recognize people like this. That's Wordsworth, Blake, and some guy called Shaky Spear or something. I'm not sure. And they have a lot in common. They're all white, they're all male, they're all English, and they're l all long dead. Now, is anyone in the audience, white, male, English, long dead? No, literally no one. There is something that's a little bit divorced from the experience that we have in our lives and that the kids that you're teaching have in their lives and the stuff that these guys have written. And it's great stuff. I actually, I love the poetry of actually all three of these. I'm not saying that we shouldn't study it, but we almost exclusively study it. And I think part of the reason is that Poetry has, as so many other subjects have, been pushed through this filter of academic testing, standardization, and all of that. And it's not the kind of thing you should standardize. If you want to teach poetry, the only way you can do it is have sort of easy cookie cutter answers that you can test to see whether the kids have fed it back. You know, what does this metaphor mean? Oh, cool, you got the right answer. That's what the metaphor meant and the effect of the poem. And it's harder to do that if you're going to go with sort of modern, real poetry and what's going on in spoken word. So if that's what you've encountered in high school, I, I want to tell you that poetry can, first of all, be modern. Poetry can be about things that are going on right now, that are real, in the real world. Poetry doesn't have to be about the beauty of a flower or about Shakespeare pining for some girl that you don't know or comparing her to a flower. I don't know why it's always flowers, it really doesn't have to be. And it reminded me of this image, I don't know if you've seen it or really can see it fully. Uh, it went viral, I think, like a month ago, and it's a bunch of kids sitting on their phone with a gorgeous Rembrandt painting behind it. It went viral because, you know, the older generation and, uh, and, and kids on their phones and blah, 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 it doesn't matter. And it's funny to me for two reasons. The first is, it turned out that the phones were running an app that is the guided tour of the Louvre. So actually, the entire complaint was wrong. They were engaging with the material. I feel like we often don't give the younger generation enough credit that they actually actively do that, and a lot of people do. The second is this. The phone is actually more interesting than the painting. It just actually is. If Rembrandt walked into that room, he wouldn't care about any of the paintings. He would be like, this little device gives you access to the sum of human knowledge at your fingertips by sending a signal into space, and then that's cool. And to think that that's cool, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's cooler than flowers. I'm going to say almost objectively so. Maybe you disagree, and that's fine. The other thing poetry can be that you don't get from those two guys is it can be non-serious. They tend to write very, very serious poetry. It's always love or war. You know, it, it has those topics. And I think part of the reason is it's, it's hard to study someone like Shel Silverstein. But I think it's worth trying because I think kids can en engage with that poetry more. And a lot of them want to. They want to write silly poetry. 
they want to write about Minecraft or whatever, or an animal that has, you know, three heads and ten butts, or, you know, and that's fine. And great poetry is written about that nowadays. You go to, I run poetry nights, you go to them, you get both the silly and the serious. You get the highly structured and you get the complete no structure at all stuff. And the other thing poetry can be that we don't really let it be often in school is locally relevant. You've probably read a lot more Shakespeare than you have read poems about the Umbrella Revolution. And that's not to say that there aren't tons of really great poems being written about the Umbrella Revolution, that there, aren't, there isn't art being made of the Umbrella Revolution, and there isn't uh, short stories and novels and stuff being written about that. There are. I've seen them. I've engaged with them. There are publications that are local that have put out you know, entire journals that are just collections of local poets engaging with that stuff. And if you want kids to care about poetry and not leave high school thinking like poetry is boring, it has to be relevant. You know, 16th century England is just not that relevant to a kid like, like the girls who are up on stage singing or any of the kids you teach. Hong Kong is relevant. What's going on in their real lives is relevant. Technology is relevant. And not only can poetry be that, it is. If you go out and engage with poetry after high school in the real life, you go to an open mic, you go to a spoken word event, it's all relevant. Some of it is non-serious and not highly structured. It functions on the local level. If you go to an open mic in Boston or in Hong Kong, you're going to hear very different things. If you go to an open mic in England right now, it will probably be all about Brexit. And that will be interesting and Basically, I would like, and it's, it's a big request almost, but high school poetry, and I wish it had a little more for me, and I actually came out loving poetry, so it's nothing against my teachers either, but it should try to be these things. It should try and engage what poetry is like in the real world. We do that with history. You learn about how it affects current political situations and how to deal with that stuff in the real world. And I would like to finish off with, appropriately, a local poem written by a local poet about not only Hong Kong, but about this exact topic. Uh, it's by a very good friend of mine called Vishal Nanda, a really excellent local poet who you can see if you've ever been on the local poetry scene. Uh, and it has only been minorly censored for swear words. It is called Urban No Subs. And I have not memorized his poem, but I love it. I didn't know I was allowed to be angry that I didn't have a voice. I remember that. I remember being made guilty for who I was as if it was my fault. It makes me realize how many people still are. I don't like your poems about animals. I've barely seen any damn animals. I don't like your poems that seem to excise mobile phones and the internet like we're all prancing through some field. The biggest field I've seen in Hong Kong is the middle of Victoria Park, and it's just dirt and grass. Your poems offend me. It's like you've trimmed away all the actual life and left behind what you think the leavings of other poems are from other times. Like rather than look outside, you bury yourself in a book, bent forward, knock-kneed, folded over, until you're peering into your own navel. It's like you refuse to see the obvious, that rather than glance around the MTR, you look down at your phone, forget that you're thumbing an app that's sending a signal into space to write about, I don't know, ducks or something. It's colonialism. Yeah, I went there. Let me explain what I mean. You transported your farms to my city. They call it Plantation Road up on the peak because the British brought back their own trees, planted the seeds, so they could cover up the tropical tiger spawning jungle with classic British, whatever the hell, proud to be boring Englishness. I'm part of the problem. But I'll admit to be virus and meme, I'll continue to try and peer through the smog and work out exactly what my reality, your reality, our reality is. But your poems offend me. It's like you've speared your own eyes to spite the world it pisses me off how the vast majority of books in stores are about Europe or the U.S., how I can't find five novels about growing up in Pok Fulam, watching Cyberport metastasize over the years. Y'all show up and skip to being mesmerized by wet markets and dim sum. 
I want to read about underage teenage flights to Lang Kwai Fung, but I don't want to write about them. It's scary trying to speak about something others haven't spoken about yet. It's hard to tell whether it makes any sense. And instead of trying so hard to exotify, well, I, it's hard to tell whether it makes any sense. I wouldn't mind if you that visit kowtow to your senses, and instead of trying so hard to exotify my home, take the time to listen. Not to the signs and the cliches, but deeper still to the corners and the creepers, and the lonely, and the lost, the marginalized, which has always been the human, and not the cost. It pisses me off how so many stories begin with descriptions inside suburban homes I've never known sub, just urban. They are half measures and throwbacks. I'm sorry, but this city is a window into the future. We're a trailer of what's to come. So if you come here, realize where you're moving on from. This is my Hong Kong. Sounds like some ad they'd play in the minibus, like a dancing virus causing a net number of people to go out and buy this product, this new lie, this thing that points upwards to happiness or penthouses of mainland billionaires. It pisses me off how much is silent and how much is noise. I've drawn a line, not in the sand, because Repulse Bay is covered in dog crap and cigarettes and broken glass, not on the pavement because we're too uptight or law-abiding, but in a book no one has read yet. In this poem, I've drawn a line. And I'm staying on my side of it. Thank you.